welcome to the interview to the interview after today's INC talk on uh, stratospheric operations from the perspective of Loon and Airbus Affair. Uh, big thank to our guests today, Jennifer Miller, David Hansel, Leo Boggs, Linda O'Brien, Nancy Graham, and Andrew Terby. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, talking to the commission today. And uh, I will uh, start immediately with a question. Uh, where are stratospheric operations today? Hi, this is David. I'll take that one. Um, they are everywhere today. Um, in spite of this being still a very new and uh, rapidly evolving technological field, um, companies like uh, Airbus and Loon have been flying in the stratosphere for many years now. Um, and I, I actually take it as, a, as a, a point of pride that most people don't know that we're up there because what that tells me is that we're operating safely. We're not creating situations of, of concern that would rise to people's um, uh, forefront of their minds. Um, we have operations ongoing around the globe. We have a fleet of balloons that are airborne at, at any given time. Uh, we have set records for distances flown and for uh, longest duration of flights. A balloon uh, most recently stayed up for over 300 days, which is a world record setting uh, event. Um, and Airbus has also uh, spent a great deal of time up in the stratosphere as well, beyond what any other hail aircraft has, has been able to accomplish. Um, so this is happening today. The technology is here. It's, it's rapidly evolving. And, and um, what we're going to see, ideally, is just an increase in the scale uh, and in the safety uh, of these operations around the world. Thank you, David. So what is LOAN actually all about? So Loon's mission is, uh, I'll start if you don't mind, Leo, and then kick it to you. Um, Loon's mission is to bring connectivity to the unconnected or underconnected. For uh, if you look at the world's population, there is a, a definite divide between um, about two thirds of the planet that are connected, meaning they have sort of like 3G connectivity or higher, um, and the remainder who lack that connectivity, maybe 2G or, or slower. Um, and we don't think that's a great way for the world to be. Uh, of, of great concern is that we've seen internet adoption rates year over year start to sort of flatten out, which tells us that the, the first group of people who got connected were easy to get connected relatively. There were uh, not major infrastructure challenges. And um, we want to keep that adoption curve accelerating. And in our minds, it, it may be difficult to drag a fiber line through a desert or to build a series of repeaters through a rainforest. And, and what that would do to the environment is, is just you know, unquestioningly bad. Um, so our option is to bring the uh, cell phone antenna to the customers, to actually fly it over their heads uh, up above 50,000 feet, um, cover a much wider area, partner with mobile network operators and with nations around the world to try to bring that connectivity to them. And ideally what this does is get us a, a more connected world, gets people more information, more ability to communicate uh, with their friends, with their loved ones, to learn things about science and medicine and the world, and hopefully bring us closer together. Thank you, David. Uh, my question to Andrew, what about Airbus and higher airspace? Uh, well, uh, first of all, Zephyr's applications uh, include complementary capabilities to what David has just described for Loon. Uh, in addition to that, we can provide uh, sensing capability and also uh, remote sensing capability uh, persistently over particular areas. Um, as far as Airbus is concerned, uh, we have the Zephyr product in order to uh, realize its potential we need to be able to operate flexibly in higher airspace or the stratosphere and that is why we're engaged in initiatives like this to pursue a way of safely and effectively realizing the massive potential of stratospheric flight for this types of aircraft mm -hmm. thank you uh, leo would you like to add something on that I think uh, David uh, said it all. Um, 
today, um, what you can see is when when you see the scale of the stratosphere corporations with uh, 350,000 hours uh, flown every year, um, this is where they are today, essentially. And existing uh, services being uh, provided, this is just the beginning, and we 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 are seeing a long road ahead of us with multiple services and multiple uh, regions going forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what about the plans for cooperative uh, traffic management in the stratosphere? Can you tell us something about that? Uh, yeah, I can start on that. Um, we have realized through our existing uh, collaboration in Australia and other places that um, we need to shift the paradigm in order to uh, realize the potential of stratospheric flight, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, and so uh, we are collectively, and that is a, a, a collective of all, really, of the stakeholders in stratospheric flight, proposing that we adopt a process called uh, collaborative traffic management in the stratosphere, where increasingly we will move from today's human-centric position-based uh, deconfliction, if you like, to a more automated four-dimensional and intent-based system, uh, which will have um, a, a federated architecture, which Leo we can talk about in a little later uh, on. Um, and that will allow us, uh, with minimal impact, we hope, on existing airspace users and, and uh, occupiers of tropospheric flight levels, to operate safely and effectively well above the majority of air traffic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andy. Loon, David or Leo? Yeah, so today um, what you see in the stratosphere is there's new types of innovative vehicles coming along and they operate in a very different way than traditional aviation has always um, typically operated at. And so CTMS, the Cooperative Traffic Management and Stratosphere, is a set of standards that enable um, traffic management via exchanging information and exchanging performance uh, and exchanging intents to enable operators to deconflict their operations from one another in an effective and um, efficient way. Very well, thank you for that. Um, let's talk about the regulators. Uh, what do you think that regulators should do to facilitate innovation in the aviation sector? Uh, well, speaking for the, the stratospheric community, um, uh, I think uh, the first observation is that uh, since we're already operating safely, uh, we should enable uh, collective learning from our current experience. Um, and then uh, it, there will be a need for a degree of regulation in the future. That's uh, an inevitable consequence of, of wanting to act globally and safely. But the key point, as far as we're concerned, is that those requirements should be uh, harmonized uh, and they should be uh, proportionate and uh, driven largely by performance and risk rather than prescriptive uh, criteria which uh, may have been derived from legacy experience rather than looking forward to uh, the innovation that we all seek. Yeah, I think uh, and the, Andy the absolutely hit that. No, no, please go right ahead, Leo. Oh, please, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, the joys of modern technology. Um, yeah, no, I think Andy hit that precisely correctly. Um, we have been operating safely up there for years, and, and what we need is, um, A, tons of partnership. I think that the more we can engage directly with regulators to discuss these challenges, the better. Um, but at the same time, um, I think we all have to be appreciative of the fact that this is a new and rapidly evolving technology. And regulatory constructs often do not support rapid innovation. And that's a challenge. You, you, it's difficult to juxtapose a regulator's obligation to maintain safety for participants and, and um, people in the proximity to the, to the um, 
to the activity while at the same time being supportive of innovation. Those, in a lot of folks' minds, those things stand in opposition. I don't think that they do. I think that with active partners like Airbus and like Loon and AeroVironment and, and Arion and Boom and the countless other operators who want to operate up at this, in the stratosphere, that those things don't need to be in opposition. They can be much more in partnership, provided that um, the regulatory um, uh, approach is proportionate and is not uh, modeled strictly on the old paradigms of, of um, regulating traditional air traffic. Thank you, David. At, at the Leo, same... Leo, you would like to add something on this? Yes, at the same time, so like Andy mentioned, uh, the need for performance and, and, and risk-based regulation. I think what is important to realize is this new types of vehicle are fundamentally very different from what we have been operating in the past. And for a lot of them, they operate at the edge of what we know uh, of science, what we know of the stratosphere. And so applying the typical, um, the traditional certification methods that we have been developing because we know how to manufacture an aircraft, today will not apply uh, to these types of vehicles that um, operators are still learning on and manufacturing are still uh, learning on and, and that we do not know how to um, best um, design without learning. And having so these approaches that allow for risk-based framework, uh, performance-based framework where we can demonstrate through flight experience and data and statistics, uh, recognizing also the fact that these are unmanned vehicles and therefore the consequences of a failure are not the same as the ones of a failure with of a, an aircraft transporting uh, human lives need to come up into like globally uh, consistent frameworks su supporting these operations that are based on performance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, well, for us as, a, as ICAO, as an international regulator and rule maker, especially for the Air Navigation Commission, uh, who develops standard and uh, recommended practices and uh, procedures for air navigation services uh, for users, operators, uh, service providers, um, it's of course is of course very important to, under to understand the needs of everyone. Um, how do you see the role of the air navigation service provider in uh, higher altitude? Uh, I think if an ANSP organization chose to offer services into the uh, collaborative space that we're talking about, then that would be fine. Um, but I think it's important that uh, as we discussed earlier on, there is a harmonization of how that would be done. Um, ultimately, though, I think that, that uh, looking a long way forward now uh, to, to uh, the future global air navigation plans, uh, there will be a, a more holistic top to bottom approach to traffic management. Um, but I think there will be a number of intermediate stages uh, as we go where ANSP's roles will evolve. Um, we're not talking about silos here. We don't want to exclude anybody, but equally we need to recognize that the relatively near-term needs of stratospheric operations, uh, as Leo points out, are really quite different to uh, traditional commercial aviation at the flight levels that we're accustomed to. Fundamentally, um, the CTMS architecture allows for a set of services, third-party services, um, to specialize and provide these services to operators tailored to, to, to the needs. There is no reason why an ANSP could not provide uh, some of these services, especially um, focusing towards the more uh, traditional uh, aviation. And what the beauty with CTMS is that it allows for all those systems to provide services and exchange information in a standardized way um, 
in a way that guarantees the safety of the the environment. Um, now the existing concepts and constructs of the ATM can can cannot be applied as is. So the ANSPs will need to uh, evolve. And to give you a very simple example, you can desi uh, design all the routes that you want. Um, balloons will follow the wind and cannot follow the route. Um, so these will need to these concepts will need to evolve and ANSPs can provide services, but will need to evolve uh, their services with it. Yeah, I think we've had um, some wonderful, really forward-leaning ANSP partners over the years that have really dedicated themselves to to finding these new paradigms in partnership with us, the United States, Australia, the UK, France, uh, just to name a few, have been really wonderful at sort of the research and development level of understanding the science behind, behind how we look at safety. Um, and I think what we really strive to attain are more and more partners to do this in real time, um, willing to understand that these these new paradigms uh, are opportunities as much as they are challenges and come to the table with an openness to to redefine how regulations and how controlling traffic in this space can actually work so sort of at the at the holistic level I think that's sort of the spirit that we would hope underpins uh, the collaboration that we have with uh, with regulators around the world Mm -hmm. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, did you enjoy engaging with the Commission today? Most definitely. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic opportunity uh, and we got some really, really great feedback too. So it was, it was marvellous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Absolute, absolutely. Second to that. Yeah. Uh, apologies for stepping on you again. But again, Zoom conferencing. Um, it's such a unique and, and wonderfully important opportunity uh, today. Um, to gain insight into um, how the ANC thinks about these challenges, because that's so representative of, of um, not just their ANSPs or their, their uh, CAA that they, that they are nominated from, but um, their personal perspectives with you know, decades of experience as air traffic controllers or airspace managers or pilots, those are just invaluable uh, opportunities for us to learn and, and to continue to expand our partnership. So yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you everyone. It was a fantastic discussion today. Special thanks to, to Nancy, Nancy Graham for helping us getting this group together. And uh, uh, I really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Uh, I hope to see you soon, very soon again. And uh, it's very appreciated. Thank you everyone. Thank you.